Hey, can you guys sit on the chair? So this year we've been following a bit of a social justice theme. 
So the first gathering was over at home in Queensland, which started with Peter Ryan that Peter's day in uh, term one. And uh, he was sharing with us some of the stories of home and the people in the background of the history of that. Our second gathering was here with um, Therese Candy from uh, Venice, and uh, she was sharing insights into particular homelessness uh, in Australia in Canberra as well. And uh, Nathan and I, as we often do, buzz around a few ideas, and uh, we thought we'd take the theme somewhere a little bit different and uh, explore some of the, the uh, Jewish tradition of justice, so the justice between the uh, well, Catholic social teaching and the religious from the, the prophets. So we've invited Rabbi Shimon Eddy to join us today, so you're very welcome and thank you again for, the, for the time and making your uh, your expertise, your words, and your, your, uh, your energy available to us this afternoon. So, a little bit of, I'm going to allow him to basically tell a bit of his own story because I'm still going to talk about that. So, once he, he opens his mouth, it's a <coughs> bit of a giveaway as to where he's from originally. And uh, been in Australia about 14 years, and Canberra two years. He and his wife have six boys, and he's just told me they live in the ages of five and a half and 13. So, that's um, pretty solid. <laughs> Be wise, yeah. That was your cue. So it's wonderful to have you with us. And the idea of this is uh, interaction. So, and, and what this is all about is Nathan, of course, is dream a bit bigger than Cedar Dreams. Uh, so we're in the stream to Forbes, Vanuatu, Queensland. Queensland. Victoria. Victoria. Um, so, do I say welcome to the people from Forbes and, and Vanuatu and Queensland and Victoria? And it's wonderful to have you with us. And we hope to have a process in place where you can also interact and throw questions at Revelation. So, I'm going to just put this to you. We're wearing you on hand. So, thank you again. And look forward to seeing you. Thank you. Um, thank you, all of you. And you people, I can't see you, but. I hope you can see me if it's working properly. Yeah, it is. He's not. Even though the nose of his doing it, he's very good at pretending. So, well done either way because it's a body of my family. Do we have to worry about it? Yes, it's a good one. Okay, that's pretty well. That's not a strong one, but it's a little bit strong. Hey, don't be full of the prompt. I grew up in Brooklyn. Seriously, that's a way to get yourself to hurt and say something like that. I'm not throwing anything to say, other people are just tolerant of I am. <laughs> um, I can add uh, the Queen's international speaker. That's right. That's great. Um, so, first of all, good evening, as I said to everyone, present and distant. The concept of justice in the Jewish tradition uh, maybe kind of gave me a bit of a vague concept here. Yeah. Um, not so much vague, maybe it's not the right word, a broad concept. Justice. It, there's so much you could possibly say about it, and I've been given what five minutes? Right? This was just one minute. I've been uh, given about 20, 30 minutes to speak about that and how we could possibly tackle like, everything there is to say. Like 35. Oh, yeah, 35 is enough. 30 would have been that much. If I ever decided to go on stage as a stand up comic, you know, my double side is just me being the one. Justice in the Jewish tradition. Um, really, can be approached in a group of ways. There is um, there is a concept of social justice, as you mentioned earlier. There is a concept of justice in any um, a legal sense, courts of justice, um, which brings us back to governmental structures. Really, uh, first thing that needs to be understood is that, as far as legal justice is concerned, the division of government in the Torah-based system of jurisprudence. Is not the same as you would expect in the country of Australia, which is based on the British common law system. Uh, British common law system. In Australia, the division of powers, <coughs> the two primary blocks of the government are the executive, the legislative, and the judicial. The Westminster system is a bit of a combination, a sort of a hybrid uh, legislature and executive. In the Jewish system is very different. The Jewish system has a combined legislative and judicial system. Um, I suppose, insofar as you can call it an executive at all, the executive is really a function of the judiciary itself. Um, the legislative being part of laws and interpreting laws, the judicial being trying cases and 
and uh, ensuring order in society, the executive being carrying out the laws. Really, because the courts are the legislature in Judaism, the executive is really just a, a group of officers of the court who are empowered in the Jewish legal system to carry out the orders of the court. So the court orders you've got to pay him, you refuse to pay, the marshal comes to your house and takes your property and tosses it onto the other guy, that kind of thing. There was a system of kingship in ancient Israel, which was more involved in matters of today we would call it defense, but in ancient times it wasn't a system, it was, uh, it was war, it was military. Uh, it was a matter of defense as well as wars and conquest. It was a standard practice in the ancient world, there's no denying that. Um, also, just general matters of keeping the peace, and um, there was some judicial function attached to but really the courts themselves were charged with three primary. Uh, tasks. One of them is the interpretation of the Torah. So, similarly to um, Australia and the Constitution, but the question comes up how do we interpret the Constitution? We can't necessarily pick the minds of the people who wrote the Constitution because in this case they're not dead. The court has to go and determine what did they mean when they wrote this and how do we interpret this into this society. The Torah was given, according to Jewish tradition, by God 3,300 ish years ago. Uh, in the desert before the age of the land of Israel. The Torah is our guiding document, so to speak, but not strictly a document, it was more an oral tradition. The written Torah was just meant as a series of mnemonics for the oral tradition. The oral tradition was really the basis of the law. What happens when a question comes up, a question of law? The courts are tasked with deciding what the interpretation is. Uh, to follow the analogy, why can't you just ask the founder, the author of the Constitution, God himself, there was a series of prophecies and what have you. We actually have a principle in Jewish law, which is in the written Torah itself, which is that it followed the majority in cases of judgment. The Torah says explicitly, Lo it is not in heaven. The Torah is not in heaven. It was given to humans, and it is up to us to make the determination of what the intent of the Torah is. So the question is, well, what if they get it wrong? What if that's not what God meant? The answer is they can't get it wrong by definition, because whatever the court decide is the law, just the same as what if the high court in Australia get it wrong. They can't get it wrong. Whatever they decide becomes the law, according to their interpretation. That's a, a basic principle in Jewish law that the Torah was given to humans, and it's up to us to regulate our society in what we best understand and be appropriate. The second function of the court is what might call legislative, uh, to impose decrees, sanctions, and Legislation for the benefit of society in general. And that can either be tied to some of the concepts in the Torah itself, um, extra rules where they see that uh, people are not treating the law with the proper respect, they can impose extra sanctions or put what they call a fence around the Torah. Don't do this lest you come to do this by mistake. Um, classic example being um, the prohibition of using fire on Shabbat, etc. The sages decree that a person should not read by the light of an oil lamp, lest he come to adjust the lamp. Absolutely, it's the sort of thing you naturally do. What would you do with the light switch with the lamp? Turn up the lamp so that you can be able to read better. There's even a story in the Talmud of one guy who said, you know what, I know a lot of most people, but I'm careful, I, I won't. Uh, and he was reading on Shabbat to the light of an oil lamp, and he turned up the light without it. So, uh, it's exactly for that sort of thing, these situations where you find yourself doing things because human nature is human nature. And sometimes we need to put that extra level of protection around it. That's the second one. The third one is that the courts were what we would imagine courts to be today. They tried cases of um, violations of the law. And that ties in quite neatly with the concept of social justice, really. Because I'll explain this by way of a, um, a story. When I was um, living in New York, which is where I grew up, uh, I had a friend who was a lawyer. A, um, an observant Jew, he was a lawyer, and he told me that when he first came in, he had just started law school, just finished law school, just started his practice, doesn't matter exactly when. He asked the local rabbi, I know some in civil law, we have distinctions between the different branches of law we have. Maritime law, we have commercial law, contract law, etc. But generally, there are two breakdowns. Standard civil law and criminal law. How does that work in the Jewish system? And I said to him, 
There is no difference. If I dig a pit in the middle of a public thoroughfare and your ox falls into it, I have to pay you for that. And if I don't pay you, it's criminal. If I borrow money from you and I don't pay that, it is criminal. The same God who gave the Torah, who told you to keep Shabbat, and to keep the laws of Kashir, and all of those other things, to pray, and to put on the filly, and to wear skin, and every, all of the so called ritual laws, the same God who told us to do that also commanded us to be good to each other, to act justly in society in general, to pay our debts, to pay our workers on time. There's a story in the Talmud of one of the pairs of great sages in the second, second temple period, Shammai and Gilel. And uh, Gilel was quite famous for the Jewish formulation of the law that which is equal to you, do not do it to anyone else. And this is where the story comes from. The story is told when men came to Shammai and said, I want to convert to Judaism on condition that you teach me the entire Torah law standing on one leg. It's kind of an odd thing to say. There's only this whole of these wacky sorts of stories. What's that supposed to mean? Shammai assumed the guy was making fun of him, and he chased him out with the, said that he's holding a building plane, he's an architect, a professional, and he a plane in his hand, he chased the guy out for him to hit him. The guy went to Hillel and said the same thing, he teaches me the entire Torah wall and I'm standing on one And Hillel said to him, that which is hateful to you, do not do to someone else. That is the entirety of the draw, and the rest are just details. Now go study the details. So, rabbis who can never leave well enough alone have to delve into what is the significance of a one leg thing. And the answer is that the draw stands on two legs. Jewish tradition divides up the commandments in the draw in a number of different ways. And one of those is the set of commandments that are between people and God. Keeping Shabbat, keeping Kashu. If I don't keep Kashu, it has nothing to do with you. That's between me and the boss. And those which are between humans and other humans. The truth can be said as to be standing on two legs. And what this guy came to him, to my person in the world, what he meant to signify was which of the two legs is the more important one? If I have to stand the draw on one leg, which one's the basis? And the reason Shabbat chased him out was because how dare you? The God who gave one gave the other. You can't say either is more important. Hillel, on the other hand, took a different approach and said, they are both important. My colleague Shemari is correct. You can't have one without the other. But if you want to know what your starting point is, remember this is a guy who's a potential convert. He wants to join the Jewish people. You want to know what your starting point is? Treat other people with something. God has infinite patience. He can wait until you are ready to come out. Other people have made up. Other people have needs that come from God. If it comes down to one or the other, deal with other people. The Torah teaches that when Abraham, Abraham, just after his breaking up, his circumcision, was visited by God. And then he saw three travelers in the distance and went to greet them. He's just talking to God. He's putting God on hold for three, you know, filthy sand travelers or whatever. What's, what's the point of this? You talk to God and you put God on Yes! That's the point. Invite them in. Make them welcome. These are my children. Treat them proper. The concept of social justice is woven throughout Judaism. The concept of chesed, which is hard to translate to English, which translate is loving kindness. Maybe, maybe not. Um, is similar to but distinct from the concept of tzedakah, which is modern Hebrew means charity. We need to analyze what these terms mean, though. Charity in English comes from late old English, borrowing from uh, early Middle English, borrowing from French, charité, which comes from the Latin caritas. <clears throat> Latin caritas is related to the word caris, which means dear or beloved. It's something that you do to someone who is important to you, it's something you do to show kindness to other people. It's something you do that you're not required to do. To help out other people who need help, even though I don't have to, I see you're poor, I'm rich. Strictly speaking, I don't have to do anything, but here's some money because I care. That's not what Siddhartha is going to do. Siddhartha is going to do the word Siddhartha, which means literally righteousness or justice. Contrary to popular belief, the term Sadiq in Hebrew is meant to be a holy person or a righteous person. Sadiq is a person who does Siddhartha, who does Siddhartha. 
It means a person who does the basic minimal requirement that the Torah gives us out of the human being. A person who does test goes beyond that is called a chassid. The is the basic human decency. If I see a poor person and I have the means to help them, I have to. There's an obligation. There are limits in that. If I have a million dollars in the bank and I give each poor person I see $100,000, I'm going to become poor myself very quickly. So there are limits because you're not allowed to put yourself in danger to save someone else's life, save the year. You can't give away excessive amounts of your own property. But if you're able to help other people, you have the means to do it and you choose not to, then you have failed in your basic obligation as a human being. Forget about your basic obligations as a Jew, you have to act as a human being. First, you have to be human, then you can do it. The Torah itself is filled with concepts of the cup. It's also from the concept of chesed. The sages teach that the Torah begins with chesed and ends with chesed. One of the first stories in the Torah is when the first humans realized they were unclothed and realized that they actually meant something. It says they'll come in new clothes. They sewed themselves some makeshift attire or fig leaves and then God made them um, high based clothing, skin. He made clothes around the skin. He clothed the naked, literally. As well as figuratively. And the Torah ends with Hesed. It says that Moses went up the mountain and he died there, and to this day no one knows where he is buried. And the reasons for that are beyond scope of the next talk, we can discuss that later. But who buried him? The Torah says, and he buried him there. Who is he? Seems obvious, God buried him. The Torah ends with the act of burying the dead, which is itself an act of As we said earlier, God visited Abraham when he was sick. When he was injured after his circumcision. Paying a visit to the sick is considered below the other people. The Torah is full of the things of the sick. Why? First of all, because God cares about people and God helps people. But more than that, the Torah teaches us that we should, insofar as it's possible, be mortal beings. We should try to emulate that. Obviously, not literally possible, but we should do our best. God closes the naked, we should close the naked. God buries the dead, we should bury the dead. God visits the sick, we should visit the sick. God helps the poor, we hope the poor. Our obligation to each other is what is paramount. And in my personal opinion, if I can get slightly polemic at the moment, that is one of the biggest problems in the Jewish world today. A person who keeps Shabbat and keeps all the laws of Kashrut, all the so called religious laws, is considered religious. A person who doesn't keep Shabbat, who doesn't keep Kashrut, is considered not religious. Even if the person who doesn't keep Shabbat, doesn't keep Kashrut, doesn't do all the ritual stuff, make sure he pays his taxes, would never cheat anyone else in business, would help you out if you needed that, if you needed that, would do anything and everything in his power to make life better for other people. He is called not religious. But a person who and prays three times a day and four times in Shabbat and five times in Kippur, and he keeps all of the ritual law. But he'd step on your face as soon as he would say good morning to you. That person's called religious. That is a big problem in the Jewish world, and I imagine it's probably similar in other religions. That's not true. Simply not true. The same God who told you to pray and to keep Kashrut and all that also told you. To be basically decent human beings to each other. This guy is keeping half of the Torah, and this guy is keeping half of the Torah. It's a problem. It's a big problem. The Torah stands on two, two legs. You can't have one without the other. But if you need your starting point, God is effectively saying through most of the words of the late prophets if only they would forget about me and just be nice to each other. All the Apocalyptic sorts of words of what care I for your fatted rents, but that you execute justice in society, etc. etc. You think stealing a sheep from someone else and then bringing the sheep as an offering to the temple is going to make everything okay? You missed the point. You completely missed the point on that. And even if it's your own sheep, fine, but you're stepping on each other on the street. The orphans and the widows and all the people who need help you ignoring the gender blind eye at all of society's problems. Or you think because you pray and because you come to my temple, it's going to make a difference. I'm not, I'm not saying it's not a good thing. I'm not saying stop praying. 
It's not all or nothing. But your priorities are in one place. If you need to pick up one leg first, that's what you should be doing. And I'll uh, just end with one more thought, which I think is quite notable. The sages teach that the reason the first temple was destroyed was because of the, um, they like to call it the cardinal sins, which is a term we borrowed from our Catholic brethren. The three cardinal sins of Judaism are um, adultery, uh, murder, and sexual immorality. These are the three sins, which are the exception to the usual rule of self preservation. Talmud teaches that if uh, it comes down to keeping the Torah or saving your own life, you violate the commandments in order to keep yourself alive. The Torah says these are the things all the person should do, and you should live by them. Live by them, not die by them. So, human life takes precedence over almost everything except for these three. It comes down to a question of idolatry, murder, or sexual immorality, you're required to give up your life while you're violating those commandments. The first temple was destroyed because the people were teaching those three. The second temple was destroyed because of what in Hebrew is known as Sinachina, which translated means baseless hatred. People didn't show each other the proper respect. In other words, they were just being jerks to each other for no reason. If you do something bad to me, I have a right to be upset with you. But they were just showing callousness to each other for no purpose whatsoever, for no gain, for no basis. The first temple was destroyed was rebuilt approximately 70 years later. The second temple was destroyed in the year 69 or 70. This, as of this uh, speech, we're in the year 2019, using the mathematics. Which one does God hold more seriously? Just a thought on the gravity of interpersonal relationship. Like, yeah. but, um, I suppose that's enough for me. I'm sure you're tired of hearing what I have to say. And, uh, I always talk too much anyway, so we'll open up to the floor and or interweb. Questions, comments, thoughts, insults? I'm interested in how you wave into this Dinashic Covenant. It's a big thing in now studying the prophets. And it's where that intersects the Zedek Mystic. Yeah. Sorry, but didn't quit that comment from I just need to see how the like, notion of covenant leads into the covenant of um kind of an obscure word. I mean the term very dangerous turns out a number of ways covenant sounds a little updated over this alliance pact. Basically, um we sort of ended up in a partnership deal with God. You, know, you will be my people and I will be your God, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, to several of them. Yeah. God, I guess we have to backtrack and poorly misunderstood, uh, poorly misunderstood concept of the chosen people. What does it mean to be the chosen people? Um, the fact is, that if we go way back to the time of Abraham, that were forefathers of Abraham, in his time, it's a mis uh, misunderstanding that he was the only monotheist in the world. Everybody else was worshiping idols, and he was the only one who recognizes one God. There were other monotheists in the world. There were other people who recognized the world as a creator. <laughs> his deal was that he was the only one in his time who actually cared enough to do something about it. To stand up to talk to the people in his neighborhood and explain to them that these lumps of stone and wood can't do anything. They can't save you. They can't help you. You made it yourself with your own hands. Why are you praying to it? There's a God who cares about him, wants to have a connection with him. Effectively, he chose God. So God said to him, hey, hey, you choose me, I choose you back. I want you to go and spread the word. In other words, the Jewish people are basically God's PR agents. So that's what we're summing up. Jews were chosen for the specific purpose of teaching the world to live with God. As such, as can be um, typical, a, um, the idea of a higher calling comes with uh, certain degrees of responsibility. So Jews are expected to hold ourselves to a higher standard. So the Torah was given 613 commandments in it, which involve living on a more spiritual and a higher level. So it's the basic, what we call the Noahide laws, which were given to all of the sense of Noah, uh, are seven basic commands 
Don't blow up the world when you're okay. Don't kill each other and steal from each other. Don't worship idols. You'd be basically decent human beings and you're all right. And that's fine. That's the basic level of behaving yourself. But the world needs more than that. God wants to have a relationship with us. Because for all the times that people ask, why would a good God create a world with so much evil in it that I'm not going to be able to answer that question? I'll put that out there. A deeper question is missed. Why would a perfect God need to create a world at all? That is that God wants to have a relationship with us. God doesn't like to see people suffering. God doesn't like to see people getting punished for doing something wrong. God is the ultimate in love, the ultimate in caring, the ultimate in chesed, the ultimate in giving. God wants to be able to give. So giving is meaningless if you don't have a chance to earn it. I'll tell you this, if I had a chance to sit and do nothing to earn a paycheck, or to work and earn the same paycheck, I'd choose to work. Okay. I feel like it's actually worth something to just you know, put me on seven hundred dollars. I'd rather be working. I'd rather do the job. It means something. God gives us that chance to earn our way, so to speak. But He wants to have a connection with us. That's you know, in this creation story. It tells of the, uh, the snake, and regardless of how you choose to interpret the story, there are many layers to it. I'm not going to start peeling the onion tonight. But one of the punishments. That's, that are needed at to the snake is that you'll crawl on your belly and you'll eat up the dust of the earth. Kind of dogs, how's that punishment? Your food's gonna be everywhere. <laughs> you can never be poor. You've got food everywhere. There's dirt everywhere. What kind of punishment is that? Because when you have everything provided for you, with everything just handed to you, you don't have an opportunity to have a relationship. You don't have an opportunity to thank God for the food you have, to recognize that in the struggle for food. You pray, you ask for assistance, and then you have a gratitude for what you get. It's as if God is saying, here, take it, go in, don't bother me. I don't want to talk to you anymore. It's that connection that is important. God wants to have a relationship with us. So the idea of it coming like that is that God genuinely, desperately cares about us. Every human is created in the image of God. We are all God's children. I love my sons. I hope that someday they want to talk to me. Like, I'm like this daughtering old man. And so he can sit at the oh, I don't have anything to do with him anymore. I've got myself set up and I don't need him anymore. I hope he's still giving me a ring once in a while. And we are empowered and required to do our best to make lives for ourselves. And don't forget where it all comes from. I'm not sure if that's exactly where you're going with your question all the time. <laughs> Next problem. It's kind of intrigued early on when you um, spoke about the, the, uh, the Torah that the written work for self, and we would refer to the Jewish people as the people of the book. The book of the but you said that uh, the oral tradition is actually our, I think it's so, I don't know, I don't know. The, yeah. the oral Torah. Yeah, it's and, the, and um, like, is that what's captured in the Talmud, or is that yeah, no, it's it's a, a history, tradition. short version of history? Yeah, here. Um, a lot of people have this sort of kindergarten imagery of Moses coming down the mountain with two tablets in one hand and a draws from the other. Yeah, he dropped one. Yeah, he dropped one. Yeah, fifteen years. <laughs> no problems. Yeah. <sighs> history of the world, part one. If you haven't seen it, it's definitely worth it. <laughs> the, um, <coughs> the fact is that the written Torah cannot possibly be what was given. In the desert, because it talks about events that happened almost 40 years afterwards. Tradition is split on how exactly the Torah was written. According to one opinion, it was written down as the events happened. God said to him, Okay, write that there, write that there, leave a space, write that there, and we'll come back and fill it in there. And over the course of the wanderings in the desert, the Torah was completed. The other opinion is that when they got to the end, they wrote the entire thing down. <coughs> Tradition is that. Every word, every letter was dictated by God to Moses. Fine. But for all those years, what did they do? The answer is they already had the Torah. The Torah was the body of laws by which we govern our lives. That was given on the mountain and brought down and taught to the people. That is what people lived for decades before the written Torah was written. 
However, it was an oral tradition, it was meant to be an oral tradition. And that continued until the second, third century CE, um, in which a man named Yudan Hanasi realized that they're having a lot of difficulty, the Roman Empire, the exile, all that other pleasant stuff. If we don't write this stuff down, then it's going to be lost entirely. It was not meant to be written down for various reasons. We'll get back to that in a moment. But it's better to have it in its suboptimal form than not to have it at all. So he elected to write it down. Every rabbi until then kept his own personal notebooks. It wasn't an official writing of the oral law, which was meant to be oral. But you take notes when you're in class. Somebody's taking notes right now. Fine. There's a spot there on it. So every rabbi took his own notebooks as he, as he learned, and questions he had thoughts. What he did was he collected all of these notebooks and compiled them. And that is what's known as the Mishnah, which is the first stage of the writing of the oral law. Which is why very often if you learn the Mishnah, you'll have one Mishnah in one place that says one thing, and another one says something contradictory. It's because they were written by two different people with two different opinions. And then when they get into the Gemara, they get into questions of, well, who wrote this Mishnah? Then they try to figure it out based upon other things he said in other places and see where it's consistent. I think the Mishnah was, um, because it was a bit of a mess, it was individual notebooks of a bunch of different rabbis all thrown together. There was a lot of debate over who wrote what, what is the final law, what's the ultimate decision, what practice do we actually follow, which opinion is correct insofar as it is a correct opinion, how do we interpret it, how do we understand it, and very often the Mishnah may say this is the law, but it actually means this is the law in this particular set of circumstances, which is not apparent from visible reading. And they flesh out all of those details in the next section, which is the Gemara, which is a compilation of the next few centuries worth of debates over the Mishnah. Those two together are called the Talmud. There are actually two different versions of that. There's one Mishnah, but they wrote a Talmud in, based upon the discussions that were had in Babylonia. And another one was actually written first, based upon the discussions of the rabbis of the Israel. The Babylonian Talmud is called the Babylonian Talmud, the one that was written in the light of Israel is these days generally referred to as the Jerusalem Talmud, which is a misnomer because it was not part of Jerusalem. It was compiled primarily in the town of Yavna and a few others. Um, in scholarly circles, it's usually known as the Palestinian Talmud or the Talmud of the Land of Israel. Uh, that one was written first, and the Babylonian one was written later. Uh, two different approaches based upon the two different overarching sentences of Jewry at the time. Now, why? Was it so important that the Torah be kept orally? The fact is, it was meant to be dynamic. Judaism is a living tradition. So, when you learn in the Torah, what you are learning is fixed words which don't always necessarily apply. I'll give you the example. If you look in the laws of uh, what we call tort law, damages, you read about uh, digging a pit in the middle of a public thoroughfare and somebody else's ox comes and falls into it. Or what if I own an ox that pours somebody else's ox? Or what if I own an ox that eats somebody else's plants? These have different rules because a pit is something you dig and it stays there. Something else goes to it to become damaged. Whereas my ox has a mind of its own and goes someplace else. As opposed to lighting the fire, which goes at random and it doesn't have a mind of its own. Even an ox, if an ox scores another ox, you don't expect that sort of behavior from a standard domesticated animal. But if there are food items there, you can expect a monster to probably get if it comes across it. So there are different nuances of the law based upon these circumstances. I had a rabbi in Yeshiva told me once that if the Talmud had been written today, we wouldn't be learning about an ox and a pit and a fire. We'd be learning about a car and a gun. These are the paradigms that would be because this is what's relevant to today's society. All we have now, though, is the written words of the Talmud. And the tradition that passes on from there is kind of stuck in that sort of mentality. And when we see a car or a gun or anything like that that causes damage, we ask ourselves, well, is this more similar to the ox or is this more similar to the fire? Or is it, which of these paradigms does it match up? And that created a bit of difficulty because the Torah has kind of become stagnant in modern times. It's unfortunate, it was a matter of necessity, it was better than losing the tradition entirely. But you can see how it's sort of suboptimal. But that Body of law is ultimately what was given to Moses and Mount, not the Rintoral. The Rintoral is what I refer to as 
Cliff Notes. Anybody ever use Cliff Notes? This is school, I'm sure some of you must have. It's, uh, you know, your teacher gives you an assignment, you have to read a certain book, you don't have time to read the book, or you can't be bothered, so you buy the Cliff Notes. It has all the major points of the book condensed in uh, 100 pages. And instead of further that concept, oh, oh no, bro. The written Torah is the Cliff Notes. It's meant to give you the quick version of it. So the Torah says you should tie it as a sign, as a, you should tie it on your hand and as a sign between your eyes. As a, a sign in the hand as a remembrance between your eyes. What is that? You'd never be able to figure out the moral practice of Tiffany from that. But you don't know that Tiffany from the Rintor. You know about from the old tradition, and you know that they are boxes made of leather with straps attached with parchments written inside of them by a hand sewn up with sinews, written uh, certain passages in the draw, written and placing them in a certain procedure, in a certain order. And then when you come across it in the written Torah, it says you should tie it on your arm and you put it between your head. Okay, then you know what I mean. Because you already know from the oral tradition. That is the basis of the law. The written Torah is just a reminder of it. Or as I heard somebody say once, the written Torah does not give Jewish law. And there's not a Jewish history book either. It gives the Jewish worldview. It's an important distinction. A lot of people, and I'm not just saying a lot of non Jews don't understand about Jews, and a lot of Jews don't get that. It's a problem. But rather than airing the dirty laundry, let's uh, move on. <laughs> Speaking of set with Yeah, so I just wanted to um, so morality, right and wrong, and justice, are those all based on the Torah? Like is that like the uh, it is right and wrong or where is it so yes, um you know there are three general different categories. I say different categories, okay? The commandments in the Torah can be divided up into categories in a number of different ways. There's between you and God and between you and other people. That's one. There's positive commandments versus negative. The do this commandments versus the don't do that commandments. That's one way of dividing them up. Another way is into three groups, which don't have easy translations into, into English, so I'll skip on the terminology. I'm just explaining the groups. One of them are basic laws that any human with half a brain should be able to figure out. Don't murder, don't steal. Those are the basic sorts of things. The other one is laws that were put in place for general functioning of society that wouldn't necessarily come to the exact laws on your own. For example, um, laws of inheritance. Laws of inheritance are handled in many different ways in many different jurisdictions. The Torah has its own system. Um, laws of damage, as we mentioned earlier. If my ox um, gores your ox, or if my ox falls into your pit, how much do you have to pay me? Full damage, off damage, partial damage, or even sound. Those can be governed in a number of different ways. The important point is that there has to be a system of governance. This is the way the Torah has given us. Logically, we come to the idea of having a system, but we wouldn't necessarily come to the details. Whereas murder is pretty straightforward. Don't murder. Okay. Let's not to say there are details that I take. The third are laws that don't make sense. We do them because it's what God has told us to do. For example, kashrut. I can eat a cow, I can't eat a pig. I can eat sheep, I can't eat rabbits. I can eat flounder, I can't eat shark. Why? Because God said so. Ultimately, really, the answer to every question of why do we do this is because God said so. But you're meant to come up with your own rationale for it. Okay? The humans were given a brain for a reason. We're meant to use it. But ultimately, whatever reason you come up with, you need to understand that it's only your best guess. Because if not for that, then someday you'll have your reason. And you'll come across a scenario where your reason doesn't exactly apply. And you'll say, that means I don't need to do it. No. You still need to do it because that's what God says. So the simplest explanation is because God said so. Ultimately, the deepest explanation is because God said so. Some of these rules don't make any sense to us. Why does God want me to eat cows but not to eat lobsters? Why can I eat certain species of locusts but not any other insect? Doesn't make sense. The idea behind it is that ultimately it is not our intellect that makes these decisions. It's contemplated. I hope there's something that might answer your question, although interestingly, um, reminds me of a, a bit of a story which is 
So you have the you know, philosophy of the drawing. It is a bit of a digression, but I'm all about digressions. That's kind of how the Talmud goes, by the way. A lot of people don't follow the flow of the Talmud. It's a very difficult document to follow because it has its own sort of series. If you need to know the law about a particular matter, you can't go to that section, but there's no that section. There's a bit here and a bit there and a bit there because the Talmud tends to go on tangents. So we'll be talking about one situation, and then we'll say, uh, you know, these two rabbis argue over something. And here's another three cases where those like two rabbis argue over something. They're nothing to do with each other. And then it'll be, uh, since this is a story having to do with a fox, here's another story having to do with a fox. Um, the oral tradition teaches that before God gave the Torah to us, he offered it to all the other nations on earth. And each one of them asked, what's in it? God told one of them, says, don't murder. And they said, no, nah, we're not interested in that. And he told another one, do you want the Torah? And they said, what's in it? And God said, it doesn't, you know, it says, don't steal. Uh, no, no, we make our lives in that way. And what's in it? No adultery, uh, pause. <laughs> and then God offered to the nation of Israel, uh, the newly freed Israelites. And tradition is that we didn't ask. It says in the Torah, Nas which literally means, we will do and we will listen. How can you do it before you've heard what it is? The answer is, I don't care what it says. Whatever it is, if it's coming from you, it's going to come us. We agree to do it, we'll sign a blank check, and then now that we've agreed, tell us what we've agreed to. When God's at the end of it in that conversation, I think it's safe to do that. The question, though, is I mentioned the Noahide laws earlier. Noahide laws basically say don't murder, don't steal, don't commit adultery. So, what are all these nations asking? What's, what's in it? Don't murder. Okay, that's not for me. Anyway, they're required to refrain from murder and from adultery and from stealing and other such things. The answer is that the you know how laws are the basic don't destroy the world and you're okay, as I mentioned earlier. The Torah is about living with God. So, why does the Torah say not to murder? Not because the other person deserves not to be killed, but that's certainly reason. I should say not only because it's bad for the other person to be murdered. Because it's bad for you to be a murderer. It's bad for you to be a thief. Not just because you're stealing from the other guy and you don't want him to steal from you. It's a bad thing if you become a thief. You are hurt by doing that. It affects you on a deep level. So all these nations that rejected the Torah because, and again, this is a tradition, it's not necessarily literally true, but it's not to us. The nations that rejected the Torah because it says don't murder, don't Listen, if you want me to behave myself, I'll behave myself. I won't kill anybody. But don't stop me from being a murderer. It's what I like. It's what I enjoy. Some people get off on the idea that they hear about a murder in some place and they want to all the gory details with a shot in the head and the heart. But what happened? How many bullets? How many, you know, shoot? I hear that sort of thing. I'm like, I don't want, I want details. It's bad enough. It's an event to somebody. I don't need to know any more than that. Okay, I'm not exactly a paragon of virtue, but. You know, I don't need that sort of gory detail. But I like to think of I'm not a murderer, not just because, okay, I have to behave myself, but it's something I would like to do. I hate the idea of doing something like that. I like to think that as a person, I'm different because of it. Did you go with that, Maria? All right. Have I written your assignment for you? <laughs> not quite. No. Because you know, I, I got a message by email once from someone at a, uh, I think it was a public school, who was doing a studies of religion course. And, um, awesome. You know, and I have a few questions for you. He gave me a list of like 15 questions, which was basically, please, can you do my assignment for you? <laughs> it's like, you know, if you want to come in and chat, I'll be happy to chat with you. I'm not, I'm not ready for your assignment for you. So, so sorry, I'm teasing you. But, uh, and the, 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 the relationship um, human to human that obviously extends to Gentiles as well. Like, like the expectation is, is, is the Yeah, absolutely. We're all God's children. Um, the, uh, the tradition is replete with that. Um, the world was created with one human for a number of reasons. Um, tradition teaches us that there were three, you know, the sages identify three reasons. It could be there are others. Everybody's you know, supposed to come up with his own ideas. But uh, the sages of old identify three reasons why the world was created with one human. One, to teach the importance of human life. Anyone who destroys a single life is as if he destroyed an entire world. Anyone who saves a single life is as if he saved an entire world. Another one is to teach the greatness of God. 
when we cast a coin using a certain die, every coin comes out exactly the same. Human beings, however, are cast using the same die, created in the image of God, so to speak. But every human comes out different, different in appearance, different in personality. That could be a lesson in diversity right there. We're all important. And the other one is to teach that no human has a right to say, my father was better than yours. Because ultimately, we all come from the same source. We are all God's children. We are all connected. We're all one in a sense. My father isn't better than yours because my father is my father. Ultimately, we're brothers or first or second or 18th cousins, however close or however far, we're ultimately all from the same source. And the Mishnah teaches that a person should always judge another person favorably. It doesn't say, doesn't say should always judge another Jew favorably. It says should judge another person favorably. And the term used for a human is Adam. If you actually read the biblical story, it's only everything in the story that he's actually referred to by the personal name Adam. Before that, it always says Adam, which means the person. He doesn't actually have a name until other humans come to see him. He's just the human. I guess when you're the only one, you don't need a name. It's like in my house, we have a cat. We can just refer to him as the cat. And somebody else will know. I don't have to call him. I'm trying to get out the door, and the cat's trying to be like, can somebody get the cat for me? I don't have to call him, but you know who he is. As opposed to if I say, you know, I said to my wife, my son. It's like, which one? We've got six of them. But that term is used to mean humans in general. And the Mishnah says that you should always judge every Adam favorably, every human favorably. It doesn't say every Jew. And ask the question who is considered a wise person? A wise person is a person who knows a lot. A wise person is someone who is willing to learn from every human. And he uses that same term as well. Then we call Adam from every human. Let's say from every Jew. Anyone and everyone has something to teach you. And insofar as he has taught you something, you owe him a debt of gratitude. That applies to anyone and everyone. Is that all right? Okay. Any other uh, thoughts? What about when it comes to the environment? Obviously, climate change is a big issue at the moment. Um, and I was interested when you were doing your little analogy before about digging the ditch and mm -hmm. the rocks falls in the ditch. Um, you were kind of talking about is that something that the human, like that we've done, that caused mm -hmm. that. So I'm just wondering what's kind of, and it's, I know it's a really big question, it's a really big area, but it's kind of it is and it should be. Yeah. the position. And likewise, the same in um, Christianity. But is there sort of a, a general position when it comes to the environment? Because I, I, I believe that when it comes to the environment, it is a social justice issue. I'm just wondering what the Jewish take on that is. You know, I could extend the words of the Mishnah. A wise person is not one who learns from every human, but who learns from every possible opportunity to be human and otherwise. One of the basic laws in the animal kingdom. And beyond animal kingdom, in life in general, don't foul the nest. Nature always closes its cycles, which is why it's devastating when any one species goes extinct because it affects everything else. We're all interconnected. Nature always closes its circles. That's something humans haven't quite figured out how to do yet. That's a problem we haven't learned that lesson. Said that humans were put onto Earth to take care of it. Humans were given dominance over the other creatures on the earth. But it said that the man, Ha'adam, was placed into the garden to work and protect it. It's our obligation to make the world the sort of place in which we want to live. Yes, we believe everything is in God's hands. And what does that mean? It doesn't mean you sit back and you say, God will take care of it. You're missing the point. Why do you have a life at all? You are meant to put in your best effort, ultimately realizing that all you can ever do is your best effort. You put it out there and it either succeeds or fails, and that's beyond your control. Humans have not been putting in our best efforts for hundreds and you know, thousands of years, but to some degree, but certainly possibly hundreds. We've been messing up this planet pretty bad. For a good chunk of that, we did not know the ramifications of what we were doing. So maybe you get a pause for that in the early generations. But now that we're doing nothing, what's the excuse? I don't care, I can't be bothered. It's too hard to make a change. Or my life's fine, 
I'm making money off of oil, gas, whatever. You're just passing the problem on to your children. And to some degree, I'm reminded of a story when I uh, was looking at Rosh Hashanah a few years ago, and I was working back on the center of Rosh Hashanah. And we passed a wood classy area, and my son just simply thrown out of the cup. And I asked if he got the Maccas or something, just throw it out of the room. And he asked, why do people litter? Sort of a naive question for the young kid. Then it got me thinking, why? Why was I writing to shit? I thought back just before that, my son had been doing a little bit uh, school on the olden days, just kind of the tournament. And I taught him about my great great grandfather, whom I never met, but my grandmother told me about her grandfather. You know what he did for a living? He was an ice man. What's an ice man? He drove a wagon, selling ice. Because what did you do when you needed to keep your food cold? You bought a 50 pound block of ice and you slid it in there. And over the course of the week, it melted, kept your food cold. Had a drip tray, which I had to empty once in a while. About a week later, it melted and went to you, wait until the ice man came around and you bought a new block of ice. That was his job. Horse and wagon and everything. I said, I have no concept of this because it doesn't exist in this world. Interestingly, my grandmother always told us that uh, when she was growing up, her grandfather lived with her. They were never allowed to buy a refrigerator because he hated them. They were putting money in business. After he died, they bought a refrigerator. <laughs> No, I was just the that progress, right? Okay. After he died, they put a refrigerator in every time. As long as they live with him, they had a nice box. It doesn't exist in this world. Okay, I mean, I'm a trained accountant based on accountancy. Accountants have existed for hundreds of years. Maybe now we use spreadsheets rather than uh, ledgers. It's the same idea. But sometimes society changes. Conversation. My grandchildren's grandchildren will be living in a world where maybe my job won't exist anymore. Or maybe there'll be new jobs that I can't even begin to imagine. Maybe my great 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 grandson will be a world class manager here on the Starship Enterprise. I don't know. It doesn't exist in my world. I can't fathom it. To some degree, it's difficult for us to recognize that we are one link in a chain that stretches back thousands and millions of years and will stretch. Thousands and millions of years if we allow it to. So if I litter, it doesn't bother me in here and now. Some long distant forgotten generation will have to worry about the effects of what we're doing to the planet. It's very easy to turn a blind eye because things are fine now. The problem is that we're in the generation where things aren't fine now. And the kids in our generation, with all the you know, school striking and all that that they're doing, are getting to the point where they're saying, enough. Look what you're doing to us. What are you leaving us? Will we have a world left in which to live? You are ultimately responsible for the consequences of your actions. And even when it's not a direct result of your actions, you are responsible to make life as good as you can for yourself. And you know, by way of analogy, I would say that um, I have heard there are some religious groups that have an idea that if you're, it's not as common as it used to be, in older times, those are groups that believe a little more so than now. If you're sick, you shouldn't take medication. Because clearly God wants you to be sick. Who are you to interfere with the will of God? You know what? In principle, that sounds like a quite theological argument. Except the Torah says explicitly, if a person injures somebody else, he's required to pay for his, uh, for his damages, for his lost uh, wages, as well as for his medical bills. That right there is proof in the Torah that you're required to heal yourself when you're sick. Yeah. God gave you a brain. God gave you the ability to understand the world, to understand the science of medicine. And uh, it reminds me of the time when I was in university, I had a very close friend who was a very, very religious Christian. And one day, so I wasn't doing so well, and he observed it, he noticed it, and said, you know, you don't look so great. You know, you're right, what's wrong? I just got a terrible headache. He said, oh, would you like me to pray for you? I said, no, I would really prefer if you brought me some aspirin. <laughs> and then if you want to pray, the aspirin works well and properly and quickly. But if you pray, dear God, I've got a headache, please make it better. I created medicine. I created doctors. I gave them the ability to take pills that will make you better. Why are you pestering me? You are required to take your destiny in your own hands insofar as you are able to. Ultimately, you realize that your success is beyond your control, but your effort is not. Getting back to environmentalism, you see something that's doing, do it. I can't think of that way for me. 
Mishnah says, in a place where there are no, it says, in a place where there are no men, stand up and be a man. Okay, despite the uh, male centric language of Mishnah, because man is such a quote with the title, the point is man. Be the one to stand up and do something about it. In the case of the environment, definitely something needs to be done. There are a lot of people out there who flat out deny the science because they don't want to, or because they have theological reasons for doing so, or because they're um, too great to contemplate, or because they have a financial interest in the environment. Um, I would say that, again, God gives a brain and wants us to use it. And everything that I see out there, the peer review uh, literature, says that the world is going down very quickly. That can't be the world. I place great, great faith in the human brain, in the intellect that God has given us, and the ability he has given us to make a world a better place. Just to do it. Sorry, I'm a little gold, a little polemic there again. These things matter. I do have a hybrid car. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, we have um, hit 6.30, but uh, yeah, yeah, it's past my bedtime. <laughs> you got six boys to go and unravel. <laughs> yes. Um, so, look, thank you very, very much for your, um, for your words. Come on, your inspiration. And we didn't get anything from the... Uh, from we get any uh, on the interweb. I'm not disappointed in you, I just wish I were present. <laughs> Sorry, it's, it's hard to... I'm talking, to a I'm talking to a camera. Yeah. You, know, you, you are real to me. There might be a bit of Matthew at the other end. Hmm? <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> are you hanging around? Oh, I've got, got a few minutes, so if anyone would like to, just um, have a minute or two with the rabbi. Mm -hmm. But thank you very, very much for your time and the, the Inspirational thoughts and ideas, and certainly, uh, I think mean, there's, there's several, well, many ideas that we have inside, increased inside the Jewish faith. And the, um, I, I would say, in, in, in general, um, I just sound like I'm plugging myself if anyone does think of anything that you know, later on is like, oh, I should have, or I meant to. Yeah. Uh, you have the contact information, yeah. Pass on, feel free to pass along. Yes, nice email. Or, Following or whatever, yeah. just drop me a line. I can't always guarantee that I'll have the answer to every question. I can guarantee that I won't, but I can always give you my prepared two cents. Wonderful. It's about what it's worth. Yeah, perfect. Wonderful. Excellent. But if there's yeah. any other thoughts, and yeah, I'm thanks. Here. Well, that'll be around for a little bit. So thank yeah. you again. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. <laughs> or just whatever. Get a photo. What about us? Smile. Pretend you're happy to be here. Yeah. No, no.